National Security Police arrest Cardinal Joseph Zen and four other trustees of the 612 Humanitarian Fund. The Hong Kong New Faculty of Medicine urged staff members and students to avoid dining out in Kennedy Town this week. And Hong Kong bracing for heavy rain and thunderstorms in the next few days. Good evening. According to sources, former lawmaker Sid Ho, who's still serving a jail sentence, was arrested in prison by police today. She is the fifth trustee of the 612 Humanitarian Fund, arrested on suspicion of endangering national security. Four other trustees arrested earlier have all been released on bail and they have to surrender their travel documents. Among them is former Hong Kong Archbishop Joseph Zen, whose arrest caught the attention of the Vatican. Cardinal Joseph Zen stepped out of Taiwan Police Station at around midnight. Okay. So did two other trustees of the now defunct 612 Humanitarian Fund, former lawmaker Margaret Ng and canto-pop singer Denise Ho. The trio, together with former Lingnan University academic Ho Po Kung, allegedly requested foreign countries or external institutions to impose sanctions on the SAR and colluded with foreign forces or external elements to endanger national security. The Police National Security Unit also seeks to charge them for failing to properly register the 612 Humanitarian Fund, which was set up in 2019 to provide legal aid to those arrested during anti-government protests. This, as Sid Ho, the fifth trustee of the fund, was reportedly arrested in prison. The high-profile arrest of Cardinal Zen drew the attention of the Vatican. Vatican spokesman Matteo Bruni said the Holy See learned with concern the news of the arrest and will follow the development of the situation with extreme attention. The Catholic Diocese of Hong Kong urged the police to deal with the matter fairly. This afternoon, the 90-year-old Joseph Zen left the Salesian House of Studies without responding directly to reporters' questions. Lawmaker Peter Kuhn, who is also the Provincial Secretary General of the Hong Kong Shenkeng Hui, said the incident has nothing to do with religious freedom. He added he's known Zen for a very long time and believes he's not a bad person, adding that he will continue to pray for Zen. The fund, which ceased operations last August, allegedly had financial dealings with anti-China forces. A government spokesperson reiterated the arrests had nothing to do with the arrestees' occupations, adding that no one is above the law. One of the 12 Hong Kong people who returned to the city after serving jail time on the mainland for illegal border crossing today pleaded guilty to making explosives. The district court heard that Wang Wai Yin, a mechanic, made the explosive known as DNT near Ng Ak Village on Shao Tao Kok Road between December 2019 and January 2020. He was slapped with a 20-month prison sentence. Wong originally faced another charge of obstructing the course of justice, but the prosecution decided not to proceed further. The city reported another 254 locally acquired COVID infections, as well as 40 imported cases. Authorities are stepping up testing efforts in the Western District after sewage samples there were found to carry a high viral load. All five blocks of the district's Saiwan estate have been locked down and residents must get tested before 10 p.m. Health authorities say the viral load found in the estate's sewage samples is 1,000 times higher than the buildings nearby that have been subject to mandatory testing. Residents at 14 neighboring locations were also issued with rapid antigen test kits by the authorities. The University of Hong Kong's Faculty of Medicine said it strongly suggests staff members and students of the university to avoid dining out in Kennedy Town this week, adding there is a risk of a massive outbreak in the area. The mainland today reported 1,800 new domestic COVID cases. Shanghai remains the hardest hit area with more than 1,400 infections. 90% of them are asymptomatic. 35 other cases are from Beijing. As part of the capital's anti-pandemic measures, 18 rail lines with a total of more than 90 stations have suspended their services. Taiwan, meanwhile, logged more than 65,000 new local infections and 17 more deaths. 
Both figures are record daily highs. About one-third of the new cases were reported at New Taipei City. Local authorities expect the latest wave of infections to peak between mid and late May. A passenger plane veered off the runway and caught fire during takeoff at Chongqing Jiangbei International Airport on the mainland this morning. Over 40 passengers were slightly injured. At around 8 a.m. today, the Tibet Airlines plane was departing from Chongqing on a flight to Ningxu in Tibet. There were 113 passengers and nine crew members on board the Airbus A319 aircraft. The crew aborted the takeoff after discovering an anomaly in the aircraft. The plane caught fire after veering off the runway. The Hong Kong Observatory issued the yellow rainstorm warning signal twice today. This as the city braces for some record high rainfall and more thunderstorms in the coming few days. Jacqueline reports. Since this morning, an intense rain band has swept across Hong Kong, ushering in heavy downpours citywide. In the afternoon, more than 70 millimeters of rainfall was recorded. Harder hit districts including Takuling and Saikong East logged more than 150 millimeters of precipitation. The Hong Kong Observatory issued the yellow rainstorm warning signal in the early morning and once more at around noon. The weather conditions are expected to remain similar over the coming few days. An active trough of low pressure continues to bring unsettled weather to the coast of Guangdong today. According to the latest model forecast, heavy rain will start to develop around the Pearl River Estuary tomorrow morning. In view of this, we would like to remind the public to stay vigilant and get prepared. This coming Monday, showers will ease off and the mercury is poised to dip to the upper teens. Torrential rain battered neighboring Guangzhou as well. Flooded roadways could be seen in Tianhe district. There were similar sites in Zhongshan with houses being swamped. Residents in Zhuhai also had to wade through waterlogged roads. In Qingyuan, three officers were swept away on Wednesday while inspecting the floods. Two of them have been rescued while one remains missing. Today also happens to be the National Disaster Prevention and Mitigation Day. Different provinces, including Hubei and Fujian, carried out emergency drills in preparation for potential future flooding. Jacqueline TV News. North Korea has acknowledged its first COVID-19 outbreak after holding for more than two years to a widely doubted claim that the country was COVID-free. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un called for a thorough lockdown of cities and counties across the country. Tests on samples taken in Pyongyang Sunday confirmed the Omicron variant. The size of the outbreak isn't immediately known, but it could have serious consequences. The country has a poor health care system, and the World Health Organization has no official record of vaccinations in its population of 26 million people. Some experts say the rare admission by North Korea may mean it's seeking outside aid. The leaders of both China and the United States have congratulated Ferdinand Marcos Jr. on his apparent landslide victory in the Philippine presidential election. U.S. President Joe Biden is among the first world leaders to call Marcos and recognize his election win. The White House said Biden told Marcos he looked forward to strengthening their alliance. The United States is seeking early engagement with the Marcos administration, but has noted historical considerations mean there could be some initial challenges. The Philippines is a treaty ally of the U.S., but Marcos has long-standing ties with China. Meanwhile, President Xi Jinping on Wednesday sent a congratulatory message to Marcos. She said in the message that both China and the Philippines are at a critical stage of development and their relations face important opportunities. The Chinese leader said he is ready to further advance their comprehensive strategic cooperative relationship in the interest of the two countries. Still ahead on tonight's news, Ukraine offers to exchange Russian prisoners of war for the evacuation of injured fighters trapped in a Mariupol steel plant. Locally, the waiting time for public rental housing units jumps to 6.1 years.
Welcome back to TVB News. Ukraine says negotiations are underway to exchange Russian prisoners of war for the evacuation of badly injured fighters trapped inside a steel mill in the city of Mariupol. In the capital, Kyiv, authorities are preparing for their first war crimes trial of a captured Russian soldier. As Russian forces continue airstrikes at the Azovstal steel mill in Mariupol, Ukraine has offered to release Russian prisoners of war in exchange for the evacuation of badly wounded fighters. Ukraine's deputy prime minister says negotiations are underway, adding that while there are different options, none of them is ideal. City officials say Russian forces have blocked all evacuation routes out of this city. The fighters trapped in the plant have refused to surrender to the Russians, saying they fear being tortured or killed. Ukraine's top prosecutor says her office has charged a Russian officer in the killing of an unarmed 62-year-old civilian. The man was gunned down in February while riding a bicycle in a northeastern village. The 21-year-old soldier could get up to 15 years in prison. Many alleged atrocities came to light last month after Moscow's forces abandoned their bid to capture Kyiv. The United Nations human rights chief said today that a thousand bodies have been recovered in the area, adding that many deaths appear to be the result of war crimes. The scale of unlawful killings, including indicia of summary executions in areas to the north of Kiev, is shocking. Russian gas producer Gazprom says it continues shipping gas to Europe via Ukraine at the Suja entry point. Yesterday, Ukraine shut down a pipeline that carries Russian gas across Ukraine to Western Europe. It marked the first time in the war that Kiev disrupted the westward flow of one of Moscow's most lucrative exports. A Kremlin spokesman said yesterday that it's up to residents of Ukraine's Kherson region to determine their fate. Dmitry Peskov made the comment after a Russian-installed official said the region's administration will ask Moscow to annex the Black Sea port of about 300,000. Peskov said any move to annex the territory would have to be absolutely legitimate, as it was with Crimea. Finland's president and prime minister announced that the country must join NATO without delay. It is a dramatic turnaround in the traditionally neutral Nordic nation's foreign policy, largely prompted by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Daniel Rao reports. The joint declaration from Finland's President Solin Anisto and Prime Minister Sanna Marin means the traditionally neutral Nordic nation is virtually certain to seek NATO membership. The pair said joining the alliance would strengthen the country's security and the entire defense alliance. The move comes with polls suggesting some 76% of Finns are now in favor of joining NATO following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Traditionally, this figure has lingered around the 25% mark. Finland's application would need to be ratified by all 30 NATO members. During this period, which could take around a year, NATO allies would provide an increased troop presence in the Nordic region. That's in addition to holding military exercises and naval patrols in the Baltic Sea. However, Finland would not benefit from the alliance's collective defense clause until full admission to NATO. Neighboring Sweden, another traditionally neutral state, is also expected to begin the process of joining the alliance. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said he would welcome both Finland and Sweden to the fold. The Finnish government's announcement also follows a visit to Helsinki and Stockholm by British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. During the trip, Johnson signed security deals with Finland and Sweden, promising to come to their aid should they be attacked. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has changed the equation of European security, and it has rewritten our reality and reshaped our future. We've seen the end of the post-Cold War period, and the invasion of Ukraine, sadly, has opened a new chapter. So the security declaration, the solemn declaration we've signed today, ensures that our two, our two nations can intensify our partnership and take it to unparalleled heights, both latitudinal and metaphorical. Still, the Kremlin has warned of military and political repercussions should Sweden and Finland join NATO. Finland has a 1,340-kilometer-long border with Russia, the longest of any EU member state. Daniel Rowell, TVB News. 
Sri Lanka's president has pledged to enact a string of reforms in a bid to quell the country's ongoing political and economic crisis. Island nation facing severe shortages of fuel, food and other essentials. In recent days, pro-government mobs have attacked peaceful protesters in the streets of the capital, Colombo. So far, nine people have died and more than 200 have been injured as a result of the unrest. President Rajapaksa has deployed armored vehicles in the streets in an attempt to restore order. Security forces have been ordered to shoot those deemed to be participating in the violence. Legislation to make abortion legal throughout the United States was defeated in the U.S. Senate yesterday amid solid Republican opposition. Democrats had rushed to head off an impending Supreme Court opinion that is expected to overturn the nearly 50-year-old Roe v. Wade decision. The court ruling established the national right to abortion. Wednesday's effort was a protest gesture that never stood much chance of success. The Women's Health Protection Act was 11 short of the 60 votes needed to be fully debated in the 100-member Senate. All 50 Republicans and one Democrat voted to block the bill. Democrats hope the vote will help propel more of their candidates to victory in the November midterm elections. It could also bolster future attempts to legalize abortion through legislation. Back here at home, the average waiting time for general public rental housing applicants has jumped to 6.1 years, the highest in more than two decades. But a member of the Housing Authority's subsidized housing committee believes the figure could rise once more in the near future. Caleb Lung has details. The Housing Authority announced today that as of the end of March, there were about 147,500 general applications for public rental housing. That's some 4,500 fewer applications than the end of last year. But the average waiting time for general applicants has increased from 6 years to 6.1 years, the highest in 23 years. The average waiting time for elderly one-person applicants was 4.1 years, which is also a 0.1-year increase. Meanwhile, the government is expecting 66,000 public rental housing and green form subsidized home ownership pilot scheme flats to be built between 2022-23 and 2026-27. Still, Leung Meng Kwong, a member of the Housing Authority's Subsidized Housing Committee, said the authorities have some catching up to do because of a huge backlog of applications and less than expected housing production. Leung added that he would not be surprised if the average waiting time reached 6.5 years over the next three years. Chief Executive-elect John Lee earlier said the city's housing issues are high on his agenda. He plans to set up two high-level task forces to boost land supply and speed up the construction of public flats to tackle Hong Kong's housing shortage. Lee also suggested giving public housing applicants the choice to get occupancy permits even when some public housing projects' facilities are unfinished. He believes the waiting time for such applicants could be shortened by one year. Caleb Leung, TVB News. The government today apologized for a technical glitch in an updated version of the Leave Home Safe app. For some Android and Huawei phone users, their vaccination and recovery records stored in the app were deleted after they updated the app. The problem has now been fixed with another update. Government Chief Information Officer Victor Lam apologized to the public, adding that the glitch was caused by officials failing to conduct enough testing before making the app available. That's the news. Thanks for watching. Good night.